Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Noelle Waisaki with Healthcare Business Insights. I'm so excited to take you through our webinar today, Auditing the Patient Experience to Target Improvement. A couple months ago, uh, many of you might have joined me for a webinar on how HBI is currently measuring the non-clinical patient experience. We want to share with you today how we've been able to apply some of those different measurements to an organization that we were working with this summer. I'm joined today by Matt Wolbrink of Children's Hospital Colorado, and together we're going to take you through the training initiative that we uh, put in motion over the course of eight weeks in Colorado. For those of you who haven't, uh, who haven't met me yet, of course, I'm Noelle Waisaki. I'm our learning product lead at HBI, so I'm responsible for working with my team to develop and deliver different kinds of training content that you see with, uh, at HBI with our e-learning library or different face-to-face -face workshops and other learning initiatives that are being put in place. You might have seen me at, uh, speaking at our retreat with Matt Walbrink here, who I'll allow to introduce himself in just a moment. I've also been in California talking about some other things at the recent annual KHAM conference. And for those of you who are joining the HFMA conference in Tunica at the end of January, I'll be excited to meet you all face to face. I'll let Matt introduce himself. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Hey, good, Noel. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for uh, in inviting me to uh, join in on the uh, webinar here. So, um, as she stated, my name is uh, Matt Wilbrink. I am with Children's Hospital Colorado. Um, I have, uh, I've been here for uh, almost uh, a little over two years, about two years and a, and, and a couple of weeks here. Um, overall, I have about uh, 24 years uh, plus, uh, give or take, of customer or guest service experience. Um, 10 years of those um, were uh, working with the Walt Disney World Resort um, with a myriad of different roles, uh, varying scopes of responsibility. Um, I was a certified trainer, a show observation specialist, um, entertainment coordinator, coordinator of training. Um, I moved out to Colorado. Um, actually, I am from Colorado. I'm Colorado uh, born and bred, so one of the few unicorns out here. And um, I moved back in 2008 um, and uh, established a, uh, a customer, uh, I guess, a, a service uh, program with um, uh, Aurora Public Schools. Um, was there for about nine years and um, then uh, took a leap into uh, the healthcare side of things. And I got certified in EPIC. I've been training EPIC for the past four years now. And uh, now I'm really excited about this new venture that I've got with uh, Children's Hospital. So again, uh, thanks for having me on, Noel. I appreciate it. Looking forward to uh, discussing uh, our accomplishments with you guys. We're really excited to get into this. And, and Matt was with us out in Nashville for our annual retreat, and, and we had a lot of fun talking to everybody. So um, excited to dig in here. I want to go through our agenda for today's discussion. I'll give a little bit of background on who HBI is. This webinar is available to people who are not yet current members of HBI's uh, research or learning platform. So I want to make sure that I'm giving everybody a, a little inside view of who HBI is and what we do. We'll go over the customer service landscape at Children's Colorado, HBI's approach to the challenges that we understood, the customer service workshop itself, and the results that we've seen so far. HBI exists to help organizations better understand, measure, and improve the end-to-end -end patient experience. We do that in several different ways, through best practice research, data and analytics, different customized services, and of course, learning and development. We are part of a larger organization called Decision Resources Group that combines all of the different resources to help life sciences, U.S. healthcare revenue cycle spaces serve their clients and their patients better. We do that in several different ways. At HBI, we provide different services and analytics like operational assessments or denial of intelligence analytics. With learning, we do face-to-face -face workshops. We have a revenue cycle e-learning library of over 130 web courses and custom competency assessments. And of course, our best practice research, including market overviews, cost and quality best practices, revenue cycle benchmarking, and of course, webinars just like this. We're currently operating with organizations in all 50 states. 
I'm still uh, looking at you, Hawaii. If you ever need an on-site workshop, you let me know. Excited to get out there. Maybe uh, March or so of this year during winter in Milwaukee. That would be awesome. We serve just over 2,000 hospitals so far, and that includes 20 of the 30 largest nonprofit health systems in, in the country. I'll pass it off to you, Matt. Tell us about Colorado. Sure. Um, my pleasure. Uh, I'll tell you specifically about um, Children's Hospital Colorado here. So um, we're all about uh, uh, advocacy for uh, not only our patients and our families, but the, but the community. That's kind of the underpinning of what we are. Um, what you see here is our mission statement. So we are a caring community uh, to honor the sacred trust of our patients, families, and each other through humble expertise, generous service, and boundless creativity. Uh, this is the moment. Um, it's 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 the moment for action. This is the moment for for everything, really. Um, we have a total of 18 different locations that span Colorado, uh, the Front Range area, um, four of which are regional hospitals. We have approximately 5,600 hospital staff members, um, 564 beds. We get about. Uh, 842,000 outpatient visits a year. Um, we were number nine in the US ranking. We have nine epic gold stars, although um, we could be getting close to 10. Um, I'm not quite sure about that number, but um, and once upon a time, we actually got the HIMSS Davies Award. So I'm um, very, very excited. We've, we've, we've come a long way, baby. We're excited to get involved here. As we go through our presentation today, we wanna get interactive with some live polling with all of you. So if you would like to participate in some of the surveys that Matt and I have throughout our presentation, please send a text message to phone number 22333 and send a message of Noel Y. Sox 830, just like you see on the screen there. This was a tool that we used to train the, the staff in uh, Children's Colorado to get them to engage with the material a little bit differently. You know, not everybody in a training environment feels comfortable raising their hand or shouting out answers or participating in some group discussion uh, in, in front of a large group. So we wanted to give them opportunities to participate with the material in ways that made them most comfortable. And we found that this live polling tool was a really successful and useful way to do that. So we'd love to survey all of you with a few questions as we go today. And you can participate by texting in right now to get set up Text 22333 and send the message of Noel Weistock 830. Let's see if this will work here. Let's try one. So I'd love to hear from you. What would be your top reason for launching a patient experience initiative in 2020? What would be your top reason for launching a patient experience improvement initiative in 2020? Text that in to 22333 after you've joined and responses should populate here on the screen. Give it a moment. Excellent. Improving overall survey scores, patient satisfaction, improve the patient experience, yes. To stay competitive, absolutely. Matt can, can touch on that, you know, with a new player moving in not too far away. Reputation and growth. Improve those survey scores, yes. Price transparency, government requirements, absolutely. Improving patient loyalty. These are all great, great reasons. You know, as regulations are changing, we're going to have a whole lot more responsibility to talk about how we can improve the patient experience here. Get results of where we need to work on more. Yes, having insight into what the certain challenges might be and how we can address them. Returning patients to our facilities, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. We'll have a few more surveys as we go along. Let's try one more right now. How does your organization currently track the non-clinical patient experience? Can you tell me what you're doing right now to track the non-clinical patient experience? Go ahead and text that in. Press Ganey. Electronic surveys, real-time surveys, management audits, employee performance, excellent. NPS surveys, mm-hmm. Call audits, yep, lots of call recordings happening lately. Mm 
Make your day cards. I like this. Lots of surveys. We love to survey our folks, right? We'll talk a little bit about some blind spots and some of those surveys that organizations are using momentarily. This is great. Thanks so much, everybody, for participating in, in these surveys. All right, let's keep going. Matt, I'll pass to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it looks like uh, there's a lot of the same techniques that we were using out here at Children's Hospital for um, trying to gather uh, information and feedback from our patients and our families here. Um, and as Noel had mentioned before, we uh, we found that there were some definitive blind spots. So we also came up with some of our others. We, we came up with some of our own here as well. So we do have a patient family survey that goes out to all uh, patients and families um, upon their uh, either discharge or whenever they're uh, done with their outpatient ambulatory uh, visit. Um, I would say probably about eh, maybe 70% of them decide not to take it, but out of the others that do take it, uh, we do take that uh, feedback very, very seriously, and a lot of that information gets passed directly to me. So um, what we noticed was that these, pas these uh, patient family survey uh, results were starting to reflect poor customer service experiences, not necessarily with the providers, with their nurses, but with the, uh, the front end staff, with like the uh, what we call the uh, patient family service, um, PFSS, uh, patient family service specialists uh, here, or the inpatient service specialists, ISS as we call them. So uh, people say uh, that they, they, they love the providers, they love their nurses, they come back uh, religiously for these folks, but um, they were noticing a, a big decline in uh, the service that we were providing on the front end, right? Slight decline in returning patients as a result of that. We had a few uh, one-star reviews, praising the docs and the nurses again, but uh, blasting the, the uh, front desk staff or the revenue cycle staff. Noticeable lack of social sensitivity from some of the uh, front desk staff, um, some of which was actually escalated right up to our CEO. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be the, the one case that uh, is, is underneath there. So a lot of different feedback. Um, you know, people are always, they're very much willing to tell you what went wrong. They don't always tell you what went right, but they will always tell you what went wrong. So um, for that, we appreciate it. So then we called Noel. <laughs> yep, sure did. We wanted to gain a little bit further insight into what was going on. And to do that, we needed to understand what the surveys were actually capturing. We did some research on various surveys that organizations do employ, do send out to patients, and learned that most of the time, it's not capturing any non-clinical experience. So when, we, when we're sending out things like HCAPs or, or monitoring our HCAP scores in order to guide the patient experience to see how we're doing in the non-clinical patient experience, research has shown that about 96% of patient complaints are related to their overall experience. Only 4% are actually clinically related. HCAPs and other surveys are really focusing in on those clinically related questions, not diving into non-clinical interactions. There's an HCAP survey breakdown here on the screen where you can see 62% of those questions are regarding clinical information, 19% are regarding patient background information, and another 19 on organization overarching items like cleanliness or the likelihood to recommend, to recommend the organization. There aren't any questions that talk about your interaction with schedulers or your interaction with front desk staff or PFS or anything like that. Statmetrics has done some studies that said a 2% increase in customer retention has the same effect as decreasing costs by 10%. So if we can increase the number of loyal patients, we'll be able to make a significant financial impact on the organization. So because there are these blind spots in patient surveys, and different things, we needed to ensure that we were hearing from the patients, that we were somehow capturing that information to, to make sure that we could speak to the specific challenges experienced by staff so we could start to limit some of those one-star reviews, you know, when the clinical staff is incredible and provides the best treatment, the best care possible, but they're less pleased with their interactions with revenue cycle staff. So what did we do about it? HBI approaches 
our engagements of this nature in three steps. We assess, we create and deliver, and then we conduct follow through. First, we wanna assess what's going on, understand and identify the critical transformational opportunities that exist at the organization. We're gonna use that information to then create and tailor an interactive workshop with, with learning objectives specifically tied to those challenges that we identified through our assessment and come on site to deliver that to staff. And then we're gonna measure again through our follow through phase we wanna launch all of the different assessments that we conducted to see if we've moved the needle. How are we doing? How are staff retaining the information that we gave them? Is it, is it giving the improvement that we, were hoping to, that we were hoping to affect? So I'll take you through our assessment phase first. First, we needed to understand the patient experience landscape at Children's Colorado. We knew that there were HCAP scores, that patient family experience team sends out information but we wanted to know what it was like from a prospective patient or family, prospective family's point of view. So we did some secret shopping. We conducted 105 secret shopper phone calls to 18 different departments throughout the organization to understand the, the service quality provided to those customers. Each call was assessed on five call elements, phone access or the ease with which we were able to reach the desired department, courtesy and professionalism, empathy and caring, inquiry and resolution, and our overall impression or our likelihood to recommend the organization to others or to continue to seek care for our own families or ourselves. We also launched a staff challenges and needs survey. We sent this out to all revenue cycle staff. We wanted to hear from them. How do they feel about the level of customer service that they provide to patients? How are they impacting the patient experience? How are they interacting with one another? Do they feel that they each deserve and deliver empathy and respect among colleagues and patients and family members that they're interacting with? So we were able to understand the patient experience from the lens of prospective patients as well as the lens of staff that deliver it. Our secret shopper results showed us an opportunity for improvement in showing empathy. Really, that was number one solving problems and providing an experience that builds trust and confidence in the organization. You can see here the scores of all five of those call elements. Empathy and caring, inquiry and resolution, and overall impression were the lowest scores, with empathy and caring giving us the lowest score at 50, scoring just 56%. So this means that just over half the time, the person on, on my staff, our secret shopper, felt like the other person on the other end of the line cared about them. We wanna make sure that we can improve that because patients and families that are calling in should always feel cared for when they're calling in the healthcare organization. We needed to be able to give staff tools to provide that level of care for the people that they're talking to, as well as turn them into confident problem solvers for the people on the phone. Hopefully by doing that then, we would be able to improve the overall impression of the likelihood to recommend. Staff survey results showed similar needs, opportunities for improvement in showing empathy and solving problems for one another internally. We have our, ex our internal customers and our external customers, and we wanted to develop material that would help enhance relationships with both. They were often managing very high stress situations and providing, an, we needed to give them tools to provide an experience that built trust and confidence among their colleagues. The survey allowed us to take some free text responses from respondents as well. We found three major themes that stood out among these free responses. Challenges experienced by staff included that they feel rushed at the front desk, which makes it hard to provide friendly customer service. Or they're dealing with irate customers and trying to keep them calm. And that families are often rude and upset and take it out on frontline staff. So we knew that the tools we were going to teach them needed to speak to these specific challenges and allow them to have effective, empathetic conversations with one another and the patients that they're caring for. Yeah, so we had some pretty obvious needs here when it came to investing in the soft skills or as we've started uh, calling them out here, uh, our power skills, um, because um, soft or not, they're very powerful skills and um, even um, on the front end, um, they, they lead to uh, obviously really, really dissatisfied customer service uh, experiences. 
So the patient experience obviously tied directly to customer service. Uh, customer service includes service quality relationships and uh, effective communication both internally and externally. So we put together some modules that were geared to not only uh, patient facing uh, um, roles, but also roles uh, for people that are not patient facing at all, but still interacting with uh, with folks internally here. So uh, the hypothesis, uh, as stated here on the slide, when staff could sharpen their tools for effective empathetic communication and learn to treat each other as customers, the outcome would be more empathetic service for the community as a whole, thus positively impacting the overall patient experience. Um, so we did this. Um, we, we built in, uh, we delivered uh, the soft skills uh, that uh, staff was, was needing. Um, so we launched um, some face-to-face -face workshops uh, with learning objectives and activities that were designed to enhance the ability of the staff to have empathetic and effective communication both internally and externally. Um, this was an investment as the people, not just as employees. Uh, the emphasis was on personal development in addition to professional development. Um, it was a grand total of about eight weeks of training where we trained uh, a total of 849 staff members. We had three train the trainer sessions with uh, 40 different managers from various different departments who came in um, wanting to be champions for this, uh, wanting to be um, sort of proprietors, if you will. Um, it was really, really, really good buy-in. Uh, we actually had a lot more people uh, than that, that that wanted to be on board with us, unfortunately, just because of the uh, space constraints, we had to limit it down to about 40. Um, but uh, we had overall uh, uh, 36 um, train the staff sessions with 809 staff members there. Um, and we did this over a couple different uh, locations. As I mentioned, we have uh, 14 different locations. Ah, there we go. 14 different locations all over the uh, uh, Denver and the Front Range area here. So uh, most of the training took place in Aurora, which is where kind of the main hub is for the Children's Hospital. Um, we also did some out in Colorado Springs. And then for those folks um, that are a little bit more demographically challenged or um, geographically challenged rather, um, they, they couldn't actually make it because we do actually have a, a healthy amount of staff members that work out of state. Um, they work on a permanent work from home basis. Um, we uh, were able to offer a WebEx for those. I'll toss it back over to uh, Noelle, and she can uh, give you another insight survey. Excellent. So let me hear from all of you. What soft skills do you think are most important when delivering a great patient experience? Listening, yes, absolutely. Having a friendly voice. Having compassion, yes. Those listening skills coming in again. Being very welcoming, absolutely. Yeah, eye contact, tone of voice, being a warm, welcoming person who is very calm, absolutely. Being a problem solver, yes. Double problem solving, yeah. Love it. Yes, body language, having empathy, and patience. Yes, all of these things are so important. Commitment to assist. Oh, I really like that one. You listen to hear and not just respond. Yes, so many times patients just want to be heard. This is wonderful. Having a welcoming attitude. Very good. Thanks for sharing, everybody. I'll move on to the next slide here. Yeah, so these are all really, really good, um, as, as Noel pointed out. Um, I think every single one of these plays a part in the overall uh, customer service satisfaction. Um, the big one, though, I think was 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 empathy. Um, that's kind of what we thought, and that's, that's where um, we kind of uh, based all of the instructor-led workshops. Uh, so what you are looking at right now are um, some the, the three different workshops that we had uh, we had devised uh, to kind of break it all down here. So each one of these, um, I guess, themes was broken down into a separate, uh, like a 90 minute module, uh, roughly two hours, kind of depends on the size of the class and the interaction. Um, these were all very, very audience participatory. Um, so there was like 
kind of an equal amount of instructor led versus what people were throwing in as far as their own personal stories. Um, but the first module uh, really focused on your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and how they interact uh, amongst themselves and how just about every interaction you have with any person at any given time throughout the course of your day is, is going to trigger any one of these. So it could be a thought that then provokes a feeling, which then uh, triggers a behavior. Um, it could be a feeling that triggers a behavior that then um, you know triggers a, a, a counter thought. But it's a it's a cycle, and um, so the first module kind of talked about that cycle, and it talked about how you can uh, how, how uh, you need to be kind of consciously aware of of how you're you're um, perceiving different things, and how you will uh, how by changing your thought process, um, or at least kind of putting yourself uh, looking at things through a different lens, you may be able to um, take negative feelings or negative thoughts and turn them around um, to produce more positive thoughts, right? Uh, the second module uh, focused on what we call the listening pyramid. So everything from ignoring to uh, distractive or, or pretend listening to selective listening, attentive listening, and then what we get to is the, the empathetic listening um, at the very, very top there. And um, how at different stages of your life, um, you've I'm sure been at any one of these stages here. Um, I don't think there's a single person out there that can say that they have uh, either purposefully or maybe not so purposefully uh, ignored somebody. Um, when you have your distracted listening, your pretend listening, um, when it might be appropriate to be uh, to practice selective listening. Um, sometimes putting filters on things can help you filter out the actual message if somebody's very long winded, as I tend to be sometimes. Um, then your attentive listening, uh, which is kind of what, what really what we're uh, striving for, and then the very tip top of the pyramid there, which is your empathetic listening, um, which is where you're actually putting yourself in your customer's shoes, really trying to uh, understand what it is they're going through, really kind of placing yourself in that position so that you can fully grasp their situation and, and help them to the best of your, abil of, of your ability. The third and final module, Focused on effective communication, the four different keys of communication, uh, which are nonverbal, uh, which some of you had, had mentioned on that previous slide there when you said eye contact and body language there. Uh, we talk a lot of, about that because people aren't always going to tell you what they think, but their posture and their body language will never lie. Uh, paraphrasing uh, what, you're, uh, what, what you're hearing so that way you understand you're getting the correct content and getting good takeaways. Uh, what we call the WIFM, which is the what's in it for me. So uh, again, kind of paraphrasing things or saying things so that instead of saying, well, this is what I'm getting in return, it's what are you going to get in return? You know, how if I pay my bill on time, how is that going to benefit me as opposed to just benefiting the company, right? And then your balanced response. Um, so uh, more often times than not, if we can't provide a service, it's very easy to say, well, I'm sorry, we just can't do that. And we just leave it hanging. So um, by providing a balanced response, you're saying, I can't do that, but I can do this. So maybe if you're able to offer an alternative. Um, these modules were a huge hit. Um, everybody really, really enjoyed them. So um, some of the measurements that we had um, from, from our, our staff members here, uh, the content and the delivery uh, were adopted systematically based on queries and the identified needs of the participants. Most common questions from the participants were, so when are the docs gonna have to take this? When are the providers gonna have to take this? Um, just because there appears to be a uh, kind of a disconnect between what's going on on the clinical side versus the non-clinical side. Um, so uh, some of the questions that we had, there was, there was many, uh, many survey questions that went out um, to the staff members about how they felt about these, these uh, these different modules. Um, these are uh, three of the most popular ones here. So how clear was the presentation of the information? Um, as you can see, over 71% uh, thought that it was very, very clear, uh, very well uh, given. How do you feel about the amount of information that was presented um, overall? Um, over 87% uh, felt as though it was a good, adequate amount of information. People didn't feel like they were bombarded with it. People didn't feel like it was not enough. 
Um, in some cases, people said that uh, they would like to have had more because they really enjoyed kind of getting into things. In fact, one of the uh, feedback, uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we did get um, when, when asked about the uh, uh, overall impression was that um, some of our folks said that they would really love to go out and have a beer with the HBI trainers because they were so cool to talk to. So, um, and then how was your instructor? Um, obviously, um, they were very engaging, as you can see there. Um, over 75% said that they were uh, highly engaged. Um, it, some people said it was actually the absolute best training that they've ever had here at uh, Children of Colorado. So kudos to HBI for doing a uh, fantastic job on that. Thank you. We had a really, we had a really good time doing it. Yeah, um, and the staff loved you. And here's just some of the comments that we had. These are actual photographs taken from um, some of the actual classes there. Um, so uh, if you guys wanted, to, you, you can I'll just let you read those there. My favorite one here is uh, in the uh, lower right-hand corner. So this was a good reminder of why we do what we do for the betterment of the community. Um, so the overall, that's really what it all came down to is in some cases, just reminding people why they're here and why they took the job. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, we had a really, really, really good time. The Colorado staff were so interactive and really joined in all of the different activities that we had created for them. So I, we had a really fun time facilitating these workshops to everybody um, because everybody was so excited to, to take in this information and put it into use. So of course we want to now measure. How did it go? What did we do? Did we, did we move the needles that we set out to move? The needles that we identified through our assessed phase that we really wanted to impact were the empathy and caring, inquiry and resolution, and the overall impression. After launching a second round of secret shopping phone calls, we learned that we did in fact move the needle. We improved our score for empathy and caring by 10%, inquiry and resolution by 16%, and the overall impression or the likelihood to recommend by 9%. You can see here on the bottom of the screen the before and after scores. We're really proud of the movement that we had here. Here you can see the breakdown for each of the departments. The blue bar that you see is the pre-workshop scores. The orange diamonds are the post-workshop scores. In those three buckets that we set out to improve, empathy and caring, inquiry and resolution, and overall impression, you can see that we moved up in almost every single department. There are a couple outliers, for example, the child health clinic um, that the score went down in empathy and caring it was because it was very difficult for us to um, have somebody answer the phone. So it's hard for us to feel empathy or that we're, we're cared for if, if we couldn't get um, somebody on the phone when, when we called. We talked to a couple of people, um, but that does impact that score there. But for the most part, everyone else went up, which was great, great news, and we're very proud of that. What else did we see? We were able to take out some trends. What, what did the numbers show from our, calling, from our caller sheets? I really liked these specific uh, data points that jumped out at me. The percent of shops in which callers stated that they felt the Colorado staff member was actively listening to them. Before the workshop, scored a 62%. After the workshop, scored 79%. The percent of shops in which callers stated that the Colorado staff member's tone of voice made them feel comfortable and assured. Before the workshop was 43%, after 57. The percent of shops in which callers reported the Colorado staff member asked questions to better assist the caller, 55% before, 70% after. And while we didn't set out to affect phone access, I did want to point this one out. The longest hold time that was recorded prior to the workshop was about 51 minutes. The longest hold time that we recorded after the workshop was only 14. We didn't just do secret shopping on Children's Hospital Colorado. We also did it on five other similarly sized pediatric organizations across the country. We wanted to see where they ranked in terms of some of their national competitors. You can see here on the screen now the, the different scores for each of those five buckets for our blinded study. The gray boxes represent those scores of those other organizations that we conducted secret shopping phone calls at in similar apples to apples departments. 
You can also see Children's Colorado pre-workshop scores in, in that orange color and their post-workshop scores in the blue. I really am excited to point out that pre-workshop, empathy and caring, inquiry and resolution, and overall impression, Children's Hospital Colorado was among the lowest, if not the lowest, scoring in those three buckets. After the workshop, however, they shot up to the top. I think that's tremendous improvement and shows that the staff are really motivated by the, the learning objectives that we, that we achieved and able to retain and, and put the information that they learned to use. So I'd like to ask you another survey. Which of those five call elements do you think your organization struggles with the most? And I'll put up some multiple choice options here. Which of these five elements does your organization struggle with the most? Text in A, B, C, D, or E for us here. Phone access surging ahead out of the, out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Inquiry and resolution in second place here. Turning people into problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Inquiry and resolution coming out ahead. I think that that makes a lot of sense. You know, there's been there's a lot of focus on empathy these days, which I think is fantastic. The next step is empowering our staff to turn them into problem solvers, partners who are problem solvers for the people that they're working with, they're working for, and the community that they're serving. I want to share with you some post workshop secret shopper details. Our our secret shoppers documented a lot of information throughout their calls, including things they talked about, why they felt ways that they did, and some of these specific testimonials jumped out at me. I won't read all of them for the sake of time here, but I will read that very last one. I don't know how to describe it, but you could tell she talked with a smile on her face. I love that because I think that is so true. You can tell when somebody is attentive and sitting up and smiling on the other end of the phone. Nonverbal communication is so easy to pick up, whether you're face-to-face, -face, on the phone, whatever, whoever it is you're talking to, it will shine through. And I'm so excited that we were able to help bring this out. So we did the secret shopper. What about staff survey? We relaunched that as well. We wanted to see if we were able to move the needle in terms of staff perception of the type of customer service that they provide, both internally and externally. A few questions stuck out to me is very interesting for comparative analysis. The question of how often do you provide an excellent service experience? Pre-workshop, almost 73% of respondents said always, absolutely, I always provide an excellent service experience. After the workshop, it seems that we've increased self-awareness among staff members because that always bucket dropped to about 52% of respondents. You can see that the almost always box has increased by about 16%. Given, being given the vocabulary and a different understanding of what stellar customer service could be, or what more we could do for each other, what more we could do for the community that we serve, has allowed people to understand, you know what, there is probably a little bit more I could do. I could do a warm transfer instead of a cold transfer. I could go above and beyond now and again when, when time permits to track down those answers rather than just transfer it off to someone else. I can look people in the eye. I can listen differently and put my phone down, right? So we're seeing some increased self-awareness. I'll share with you another question. How often do you tailor your communication to the needs of customers, internal and external? Pre-workshop, 80% said always, all the time. Post-workshop, that bucket dropped to 58%. So again, we're seeing that shift from the always to the almost always as people are learning, yeah, there's probably a little bit more that I could do here. How often do you become an engaged listener during each customer interaction? Like Matt described, one of the modules was fully dedicated to the different levels of listening, what those are and how we can employ them. Pre-workshop, about 70% said always. 
post-workshop dropped to about 50%, 49%. So it's fascinating to see this, these different levels of self-awareness come in after going over different vocabulary, different ways to reach out to people, different ways to serve the customer internally and externally and let them know that their situation matters, that really here at Children's Colorado, it's different. So for where we're going uh, from here on out uh, with uh, Children's Colorado, um, I have uh, partnered with uh, the patient family experience team um, and uh, also the clinical applications team to identify opportunities for improved integration of patient family experience and service excellence initiatives. Um, and it's going to become uh, an, organi an organization wide uh, push uh, for 2020. So we're going to break down the silos, uh, generate some common language that supports the idea that we are all uh, patient family experience, clinical and non-clinical. That's the PFX you see there. Uh, we're redefining the patient family experience as habits, not necessarily standards, but habits that we want everyone to be able to uh, understand and, and practice. We're building quantifiable strategy plans and observation tools for the managers to hold teams accountable. We're sending out self-assessments focused on empathy, uh, we're uh, developing uh, training to break down the barriers in the departments that use Epic Kiosk by enforcing techniques uh, that focus on what we call tacos, which are uh, <laughs> teamwork, attitude, consistency, open-mindedness, and uh, service, uh, which are going to be our, our five different ways that we define um, the uh, customer service experience when you're, when you're dealing with, with kiosks. Um, important to understand that uh, we've implemented the uh, welcome kiosks. In doing so, um, we haven't lost any team members. Um, we haven't uh, replaced any team members. We haven't downsized at all. This is a, a very uh, important partner in uh, technology. So we're keeping everybody on board. We've kept everybody on board. Right now, we are at about an 85% utilization rate, and uh, we are moving forward with this, this uh, training. So we're also going to continue to track the results and collect data, um, just as Noel and the HBI team has, uh, hoping to find steady growth and sustainable results. And we're going to begin focusing on the scheduling departments by Q4 of next year. So with all that being said, um, what questions might you all have for either Noel or myself? Yes, please send them through the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, in your screen, and we'll be able to have a few minutes to answer any questions that you have. How many hospitals has HBI worked with regarding the non-clinical patient experience? Actually, Children's Colorado was our kickoff. It was not um, a workshop aspect that we had um, employed before, we, specific to the, the customer service aspects that we talked about in, in these modules. Um, we have worked with several different organizations now, probably four to six just this year on other revenue cycle related patient experience aspects like point of service collections, best practices. That's actually what I'm on site delivering a face-to-face -face workshop for almost 300 staff um, this week as we are um, going through, through those types of workshops to enhance that non-clinical patient experience as well. What are you doing to keep this at the forefront of employees' minds on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve sustainability? Matt, would you like to speak to that? How are, how are we keeping this active in the minds of your staff? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny because that, that was a, a common theme that we got, especially during the train-the-trainer class. Um, uh, how are we going to keep this uh, going? How are we going to move forward with it? How are we going to ensure this isn't just like a flavor of the week or flavor of the month? Um, and uh, the answer is quite simply by constantly reminding them of it. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're really engaging and empowering our supervisors and managers. We're giving them the tools uh, to audit their staff, um, to make uh, rounds and observations, um, and uh, we're making it a really, really big focus. So um, we, uh, we're, we're um, as I mentioned before, we're partnering with, with a, a department called the uh, the patient family experience. And um, for 2020, this is going to be a huge push. And it is going to be organization wide. It's going to be clinical, non clinical. It's going to be everybody. So even for all those folks that said, hey, what about the docs? Are they going to get this training? They, they absolutely are going to get a version of this training, not the same training that uh, HBI provided and that we're continuing to provide on the rev cycle side. 
But it is going to be it's it's a big culture shift uh, within our organization. Um, so I think sometimes when uh, we we kind of take our reputation for granted, sometimes we we tend to get a little bit. Um, um, I'll just say a little lackadaisical sometimes when it comes to our efforts. So starting in 2020, we're going to start pushing those efforts forward again. We're going to start re refocusing on, um, you know, what sets us apart from other pediatric organizations. We have several uh, competitors now. Um, it used to be the Children's Colorado was the obvious choice whenever people needed uh, pediatric help, um, whenever they needed, uh, you know, to send their kids to the hospital or come to a, a, a clinic. Uh, or specialty, but now we have the Rocky Mountain Pediatrics Organization, we have Centura, we have Health One, we've got a whole uh, myriad of different options now. But um, ultimately, um, this is living um, within the departments. We obviously have a centralized organization, which is myself and the patient family experience, which is driving this, but it lives, really lives, and it, it thrives, and it continues to to grow and it continues to uh, work on a very passionate level with the department managers and supervisors. And um, we're also moving forward with uh, kind of secret shoppers of our own. We're, we're utilizing um, um, what, what I like to call rock stars. There are customer service rock stars. These are people who are very, very passionate about what they do. They've never lost focus on it. Um, people enjoy interacting with them. They exemplify all of our, uh, what we call the uh, balloon boy standards. Um, our, our logo is, of course, a little boy carrying balloons. Um, so uh, we, we have the balloon boy standards of people who continue to exemplify and exceed those standards are going to become our rock stars. We're meeting with them on a regular basis, um, once a quarter, once every two quarters. That really hasn't been determined yet. But um, we have a lot of different things in, in place. Um, but ultimately, what it comes down to is how are the departments going to hold their teams accountable? I also got a, a question here from uh, Mr. Thomas that says, what about patient registration times per customer? Um, I just want to make sure that I, I understand this correctly. So if you're, you're asking about, you know, how does this go, how, what about the, the registration time, like the, the time that it takes to get patients registered? Um, the good news about the kiosks is that patients can do that kind of on their own with the gentle assistance of the people who are working there at the front desk staff. Um, we've also been... Um, very uh, strict about our registration times and what the recommendation is. We're revisiting that. Um, I am unfortunately not really a part of those those decisions or a part of that dialogue, but um, I know we are revisiting those because in a lot of different uh, cases, we got some feedback from our staff members saying that, hey, we, we have to meet this criteria. We have to meet these numbers. There's no time for customer service when you have to meet these numbers, when you have to get so many phone calls in. So um, there's a panel of, uh, of folks in our leadership that are revisiting those. So hopefully that answered your question. Excellent. And I see one more question here. Uh, it says, are you converting the in-person training to an online course for your new hires? We do have that, uh, that option. We have not yet explored it because we wanted to see how things were going with clinical staff. Uh, with the training that the organization was putting together for them to see what other challenges might exist, but it's absolutely an option that we would be able to flip all of the information that we put in those modules into e-learning to, to be uploaded to the LMS. Something to talk about with regards to flipping it into e-learning is that we, we do lose that ability to have the engaging interactive activities that we do throughout the workshop that really helps uh, participants solidify those learning objectives and interact with it and have those really useful small group discussions. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that starting with the face-to-face -face and then following up with the uh, online learning to also keep this top of mind and that, that would be another way to keep everything in the learning objectives alive as, as we continue to, to go on um, would definitely be a, a useful thing. Right now, uh, it's just the face-to-face, -face and Matt has taken on the responsibility of training all the new hires that have been coming in since then. Yeah. yeah we've, we've taken all three of these modules, the way you talked about earlier, and combined them into one um, approximately five-and-a-half-hour class, and it has been 
um, met with rave reviews. Uh, people have thoroughly enjoyed it. It really gets people talking. They they enter the room as complete strangers on their personal devices, not interacting with each other at all. And usually by the end of the class, they're socializing with each other, laughing, joking around, making plans to go out and have dinner. <laughs> An extreme situation. But, yeah. Exactly. And I see one last question here. How long were those face-to-face -face sessions? Each of those modules were about 90 minutes. Um, right, right, Matt? Yeah, 90 minutes. Yes. So in total, it was closer to, to five and a half, six hours worth of information. So I think that puts us at our last question um, for the day. Yep, just want to make sure nothing else is coming in. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Matt, for going through this with me. You, you've been such an incredible partner. We've really enjoyed this engagement uh, over the whole summer and getting to know Children's Hospital Colorado. We just had such, such a fun time and I'm so happy for the impact that we've been able to make and look forward to doing, doing more and helping us push out great customer service experience and patient experience to our organizations across the country. Likewise, thank you. Thanks for everything you've done. If anybody has any additional questions, go ahead and shoot me an email or give me a call. My contact information is on the screen. And until then, we'll talk to you next time.